is Robin, and I'm coming to you from the southern United States. Uh, this is my second podcast um, about knitting, uh, crochet, all things handwork. Um, thanks to everybody who uh, watched the first one. The um, uploading of the video was a huge learning curve, so I'm hoping this time to make it a little shorter, and perhaps that will help with the uploading process. It was quite it was quite an ordeal. And I may have to just change how I'm doing it in general, provided I can find time to go forward um, and do this again. So it's been a while since that first one. We've had a very busy um, busy month. My uh, college age son is home for a week this um, week between working on campus uh, where he is about four hours away from us and another job that he's going to in the mountains and at the end of this week we're going to take a little trip to the mountains as a family for the weekend and then he'll be off to that job and he does come back to us a couple of days before he heads back to college for the um, his junior year. My youngest son is doing an online course as well as working at a local kennel as well as mowing everybody's lawn around here, so he requires a lot of driving here and there, and um, but he's managing it all beautifully, so that's great. And so it's just been busy. Um, I have a garden, the tomatoes are coming in, so I've had to um, decide what to do with them. I've been doing a lot of crock pot tomato sauce, and my husband's been eating a lot of uh, bacon, lettuce, and tomato sandwiches, or at least tomato sandwiches. Sometimes there's bacon, sometimes the uh, boys eat all the bacon before the sandwiches can be made. In any case, there has been some knitting, not as much knitting as I would like. Um, I have a very busy schedule of teaching in the fall. I have three courses that are new to me, and I really should be spending this time right now working on my courses. I've done a lot of work so far, but I will never have enough done to feel well prepared for the fall. It's going to be a busy, a busy fall. But that's okay. That's not unusual. So, um, since last time, I've continued to work on my Lady Brunswick sweater, so I think we'll start with works in progress. I don't think I have anything finished that I started or showed you last time, and I hope this is um, not too bright. I uh, came out here, and it was nice and overcast and cool, and then the sun peeked through the clouds, and it was really, really bright, so I'm hoping hoping you can see everything, and I hope that I don't uh, sweat to death. Um, I just felt like this light outside was better, and then we have our dogs inside out of the heat right now, and they're all over the place, um, always wanting to be right wherever I'm, what I'm doing, so <laughs> I thought I'd try outside. We'll see how it works, and you might be able to hear, um, when I came out and set up, the pond was not turned on. We have a, there's a pond right over here and it's got some fountains in it to keep it aerated and they have come on since I started so you might hear the sounds of the water, I don't know, but maybe I'll put a little video of that in at the end so you can see what that looks like. So Lady Brunswick sweater, my first uh, work in progress to talk about. I think last time I showed you I was somewhere on the back of the sweater there's the progress keeper that I had put in there and I think I had just started with the bottom band. Since then I have completed the back. The back is knit up, this band is put on, and then you put the stitches on a holder while you knit the front and I have completed the front. The front is almost identical to the back, a little bit shorter, but it has that same uh, Latvian braid, which is really fun to do and I think really beautiful. And the front has this additional cabling panel. And since I finished the cabling panel, I have found one mistake. Um, these cables that come up on the side, the, or the, the knit stitches that come up on the side, um, there's one that has an extra row. So it's a little bit longer than everyone else. I don't think anybody would notice it unless you came up and were counting. So I didn't take everything out and fix it. But it's in there. Which sometimes bums me out a little and I'm like, huh, nobody's ever going to notice. So the front 
gets the same top trim as the back, and then there's a three needle bind off that puts the front and the back together. And then you start on the sleeve, which is where I'm currently at. I am doing short rows for the sleeve, and I am still loving the squishiness of this yarn. It's fabulous. It's Malabrigo Arroyo, um, and I'm um, still loving knitting with it and the variation in the colors. I did use two balls alternating to do the front and the back, and I don't really see any pooling. But on the sleeve, I've decided not to do the alternating right now with the short rows. Um, I don't see any real pooling right now, but I hope that's not something that's going to be a problem later on. I do have the partial balls from the front and the back, so I have um, a variation of balls to use. I'm also a little bit afraid I'm going to be playing yarn chicken. Um, the amount called for in the sweater is about 10 yards less than the amount I bought, but I'm hoping to play with the length of the sleeves if I need to. Um, for the contrast color that makes the Latvian braid, I have a gracious plenty, so I may also work that in there somehow. I don't know, but I'm hoping that I'm not going to have any trouble. But this has been a delight to knit. So again, this is the Lady Brunswick sweater. I talked about it in my first podcast. It is a three-quarter sleeve tunic designed by Joan Beebe for SS Knits, and it's part of her Mountains to Sea collection. And it's really, really delightful. And what's nice about her collection is she has, um, if you if you like, if you tried this and knit it and enjoyed it enough, she has some other patterns that use the same techniques, but are for. Um, this, if you can see, there's a vest with the same kind of technique in a child size and in the, a man's size, with the same kind of patterns, but obviously for a different audience that you might be interested in. And so it's really, I think it would be, um, I think she's worth checking out, I guess is what I was going to say. So that's the thing I've worked on the most. Um, a lot of people online have been discussing lately their, whether they're going to sort of be monogamous with their knitting or if they like a lot of projects. And I think I talked last time about the fact that I had cast on I just I get to the summer and I'm released from my daily schedule and I just want to cast on everything. I want everything to be on the needles. I want to be working on it all at once. And yet I find that also freaks me out a little bit if I have too much. And so I've sort of come to this place where if I have a couple of simple socks on the go that I can leave around the house and I can knit on in five, you know, five minutes while I'm waiting for something to boil in the kitchen or while I'm trying to think in my head how to work out a problem, that's nice because I don't have to remember where I am in the pattern. And then if I have a couple of dedicated, a dedicated sweater project and a dedicated uh, shawl project that probably require more attention, if they're on the go, then when I sit down to watch TV or something, I have something to pick up. We are headed out this weekend on a, a road trip, so there will be some knitting time there too. And so I need to make sure that all my projects are at a place where they are easy car knitting. Um, so it's nice to have several projects on the go because you never know when you're going to get stuck somewhere and then you can pick up a project. If you have a project started that you can pick up, that's always great. You don't feel like you're wasting your time. So with that in mind, I'm going to show you a new cast on because again I have cast on itis. I cast on for a plain vanilla um, sock and um, I don't see the tag for the yarn. I think it's a Bernat I'll have to I'll have to put that in the show notes perhaps. Um, I know it's on my Ravelry page. Anyway, I cast on plain vanilla sock, um, two by two rib at the top, and um, the colors of this sock remind me of the ocean or something like that. Beach trip, clouds, summer skies. It's very pretty. There's some pale green and different colors of blue and some white. 
But what I'm doing that's different for me is I'm trying some nine inch cir circulars. And I did talk about my grandmother's knitting legacy that, that she, I inherited all of her knitting stuff. And I found these nine inch circulars in her things. I have two nine inch circulars. They're boy uh, stainless steel nine inch circulars. And what is, um, I know a lot of people online have started knitting their socks with nine inch circulars, and so I thought I'd, I'd like to try it. But of course I didn't stop there. I made it more complicated on myself. I'm trying to knit this continental style. So I'm trying to teach myself how to knit a sock continental style. Right now all I can do is the knit stitch. I haven't even tried the purl stitch. And I don't find it's any faster than my normal method of knitting. I kind of like that it's contained, but... Um, and I kind of like that you can go all the way around. I'm, I'm normally... I normally prefer toe up, magic loop, two at a time socks. I think that's um, a fun way to get done. Both socks at the same time. So this is a cuff down, little departure for me, sock, and I'm trying continental on nine inch circulars. And I don't think I'm faster yet, but I do sort of like the containment of the nine inch circular and not having to drag the loop back and forth. And I maybe prefer this over the double pointed needles. I don't know. And perhaps with time I will get faster. It could be complicated by the fact that everything else I do is not continental knitting, so there's that. <laughs> but it was worth a try. And so I'm enjoying that. This is the first sock. And I'll put this in the show notes. I have a website with all the show notes on it. And I'll tell you what yarn this is. It's, um, it's nice and soft. And I believe it's super washed. So that'll be nice um, when it comes time to my everyday Friday socks in the winter. So that is a new cast on that I've been working on. And this is the sock that sits with my, um, my math work. So that when I am... Um, there's some dragonflies right here having a fight lying around me. So when I'm having trouble with a math problem, I pull that out. I knit a few stitches while I'm thinking through what I'm trying to um, solve. So then, last time I also talked about my husband's stripy socks, and I finished those in uh, June. Those were my June socks. And now I've started on the socks for me. So the back story is he brought me this um, crazy Zalber ball from a yarn store in the Netherlands on a trip that he was on in December. And I paired that with some Coop Knits Socks yeah yarn in a gray color. And I knit him a pair of stripy socks. They are not matchy-matchy because of the way the stripes unfold. Um, there's no way to get two that are identical. And I was hoping that I would have enough yarn to then make myself a pair as well. And I measured, after I finished his pair of socks, he's got really long feet, and he was very excited by them. He thinks they're just great. I weighed the yarn ball, and I have half a yarn ball left. So I used, it's a 100 gram ball, and I used 50, um, actually I think I used 48 grams on his socks, so there were 52 grams left. But just to, be, just to be careful, I chose to go ahead and do my cuff not in the Zalber ball, but in the gray. So his cuff and heel and toe are all in the Zalber ball. I think I will do my cuff in the gray. I did do the heel in the Zalber ball. And I will probably go ahead and do the toe, because I think I'll have plenty of yarn. My feet aren't as long as his. Um, although they are large feet, I have very big feet. But I just love knitting with this variegated yarn. It's so fun. Um, just when you get tired of a color, it goes on to another color, and the way the colors fade into each other, it's just a lot of fun. Um, I think the colorway for this Zauber Ball is Erbstwind. 
again, the notes are on the Ravelry page. So this is the first sock. I am just about a stripe away from putting in the toe for my foot, and then hopefully I'll get around to making a second sock. Uh, the sock is a plain vanilla sock, um, pretty much there's nothing fancy about the sock itself. The stripes are four rows. I'm using the jogless jog to make the stripes going around. Um, and they blocked out pretty well on my husband's socks. They need a little um, they're looking pretty good. They obviously need some blocking so I'll show the, that after it's blocked and finished. But So I have two pairs of socks on the go but both of them are pretty easy. Just pick up and knit a few stitches. So I bet both socks will go with me on this trip we're going on because I think there's going to be some boating, fishing, sitting around in a kayak kind of thing. So that'll be easy to take along. And then the last work in progress that I have um, is the shawl that I started for the Brooklyn Tweed Lace knit along, summer knit along. I started it to be a part of it. I will never finish it in time, but I had bought some bale at my local yarn store and I'm doing um, Hohi Locatelli's three color cashmere shawl out of it. And this is my progress so far. So I think the bottom is called Thaw. And this one is Heron. I don't remember which one is which. There's a gray with a little bit of green hint to it, and then there's a greenish blue gray here. One of them is Heron, and one of them is Norway. And I forget which is which, but it's on my Ravelry page. Um, the white, Heron is, sorry, Heron is the dark gray. I wrote it down. And Norway is the, the more green one. So right now I've got Thaw and Heron, and I've started her three color cashmere shawl. And I saw somebody else who did it out of a uh, lace weight yarn, and it looks really pretty. Um, so I'm excited to see how it comes out in Veil by Brooklyn Tweed. Here's the picture of the shawl. Of course, I'm doing it in lace weight, and I have a pattern is calling for fingering, but I think I, I think it'll be okay. The one I saw that was made out of lace weight yarn was really pretty, and so I'm hoping that it will go all right. So that's all I've got so far of it, all the progress I've made. This is a project that requires more attention. Um, and this is, this is one of the things that worries me about having too many things on the go at once because when I go to pick it up again, will I remember where I was and did I write it down correctly? I don't want to make any mistakes with lace because, you know, lace is kind of hard to... Something simple like this isn't so hard, but when it's more complicated lace and you put it down and come back and you're not really sure where if you're starting in the right spot, that's always tricky. And then you just put it aside and say, hmm, maybe I'll deal with that another day. I don't want to get a lot of projects sitting around in bags because I don't want to pick them up. But that's my complicated project on the go right now. So that's all I have for works in progress. It's uh, summertime in the south, so the cicadas have started to sing. You can hear them. They're making a big loud chirp in the pear tree over here. Okay, so what I'd like to dive into, and I have been restraining myself, but I, I have a feeling before the summer's over, I will cast this on. I bought this, um, this is a gradient uh, cake um, from Cutthroat Yarn. It's cotton. And when I bought it, I figured all I was ever going to do with it was have it on my desk and squish it like a stress ball. Because it's just... Oh, squishy and so lovely and it's so pretty just sitting there 
but I did buy it with the intent of making something out of it. And I have finally um, printed off the pattern. I want to use it to make the Spearmint Tea Shawl by Katerina Golov Golovanova. I haven't probably pronounced that incorrectly, but I hope you can see that. But it's a lovely gradient shawl and the magic of the ball is going to do all the work and so that's very exciting um, and I'm dying to I'm dying to cast it on this shawl I have a feeling will go much faster than the lace weight shawl but there's only so much time so I have resisted but it's in the lineup um, as soon as something else comes off I have a feeling I will have to cast that on So, I mentioned last time that I inherited a lot of stuff from my grandmother and her knitting supplies, and I talked about my desire to not build up such a huge stash that I leave stuff behind because I had to help clear out my grandmother's stuff and several of my husband's grandmother's, their things. Um, have been handed down to me, but there was so much that we had to throw away or donate or things that got started and never finished. And so I said in the last podcast that I would share a few of those kinds of things with you. And so today I brought something that I got out of my grandmother's piles of projects. It's a set of placemats and napkins. They're very decorative. This is a placemat that my grandmother embroidered. It's a nice cotton or linen. It's got kind of a, a, a sheen to it. And it has this little chicken motif. And each placemat has a beautiful little I think it's called a breakfast set, actually. You know, you have your morning cup of tea and your toast, and here's your dainty little napkin to wipe your mouth with and the crumbs. And she had this set. I think there are four... Um, yeah, there are four of the placemats and four of the napkins, and she had them in a bag. And as far as I can tell... Everything was done. All four napkins are finished. All of them have edges all the way around. They've all been hemmed. Um, I'm not sure if you can see all that. They had to be hemmed. They were obviously part of a kit. The only thing that hadn't been done was on one placemat. One placemat. The gold metallic thread that was used had not been st stitched in. All of this was done, but there was one place that was lacking. And I thought to myself, you know, what happened? Did company come and she just stuffed it in a bag and put it out of sight and then forgot about it? Did she get so sick of the project that she couldn't do those last three lines? I mean, it took me all of five minutes to finish this, and then they were done. And that's why I took it, because I thought it was whimsical. Um, we used to keep chickens. We don't have chickens right now, but I liked my chickens, and I have... My grandmother had a fascination with chickens, so I inherited some of her chicken items for my kitchen. And so I thought, well, this was worth keeping. And I finished the placemat, and now i got to get brave enough to use them. Um, because what's the point of keeping them if I'm not going to use them, right? I don't know how this metallic... It's, it's not really thread. It's really... It's like... It's almost like Christmas tinsel that you weave in and out. So I imagine these are going to have to be hand-washed carefully. I don't have any idea about the color fastness of the dye. Because I suspect these were done when my mom was a girl, like in the 50s, maybe the 60s. But they were, they were way deep in her stash of stuff. 
and she just forgot about them. Which was sad because she put a lot of effort into making these. There's a lot of work to embroider all of this stuff and then never get to use them. So I am going to be putting them into good use at some point um, because I thought they were cute and so I kept those. So then I thought, well, what is sitting around in my sewing room that I need to get around to finishing that I haven't? And I thought about my Christmas quilt. I started this Christmas quilt, I think, four years ago. And I have completed the front of it. I have hand stitched all of the um, circles. It is a quilt, it's a, it's a Christmas tree shape made out of balls that I saw somewhere on Pinterest and I couldn't locate the actual pattern but um, there is a pattern out there that is very similar to this. This is something I kind of wigged together myself and so I've done all this work. What it needs is a back and it needs to be quilted and maybe it needs another border or something. I haven't quite decided. Um, I've got all the fabric laying there. This has been neat, neat, neatly folded up and last summer I put the border on it. The summer before, I think I did the star. <laughs> before that, I did the circles. It's a Christmas wall hanging. It's never going to get used if I don't finish it. And I need to just decide what I'm going to do, do it, and then figure out how it's going to be quilted. And I may have to cheat and let somebody else do the quilting for me because I just. I don't have the time or the skill, and I think that's what's holding me up. I don't have the time to hand quilt it, and I don't have the skill with my machine. But, you know, 20 years from now, I don't want my children to find this and go, why didn't Mom ever finish that? Because I was too busy taking you back and forth to your job at the vet. Or going to Ikea with you for last-minute college stuff. That was a fun trip. We just did that last week me and the middle son road trip to Ikea. Um, he's got, he's changing living situations. Um, most of the big universities around here, you have a dorm room your freshman year, and then after that it's kind of a constant juggle and rejuggle to find a place to live. And so he's going from an apartment to a house. The apartment was already furnished, the house is not so much. So we were trying to find some inexpensive alternatives to mattresses and stuff like that. So we headed to Ikea, which is about two hours from us. And that was a fun road trip, and he should be set. So tell me what you do would do with those placemats. That's what I asked last time. I asked, what would you do with some of these vintage things? Um, and what is the thing that you have laying around in your sewing room or your knitting uh, cabinet perhaps that's been sitting there forever and lacks nothing more than a few buttons or buttonholes or yeah I've got I've probably got more than just that quilt that fit in that category. So the last thing I wanted to share with you today are some of the vintage things that I have from my grandmother. I thought it would be fun to share those things with you um, from time to time and since I was trying out the nine inch circular needle, I thought I'd show you some of the double point needles that came with her stuff. So the first thing that she had, she had several sets of these whisper smooth uh, precision tapered point double point needles but they're 10 inches long so they're really not, they're probably not intended for sock knitting but um, in fact, the picture on the front, it, well, I don't know. I'm not really sure what kind of knitting you'd use that for. Perhaps um, small garments or something. But these are 10 inch double points. This, these happen to be size 2. And then this is the same thing. Um, they're 10 inch double pointed needles. But this is from the Boy Company instead of the Susan Bates. These are Susan Bates. This is from Boy. Susan Bates. There's our whispered, sm whisper smooth with precision tapered points. 
whereas Bates knitting needles are have perfection points for happy knitting. And 75 cents bought you these. This must have been another couple of years later because these were 85 cents. Who knows? 75 cents, 85 cents, gotcha. Some aluminum double pointed needles, size 2, size 3. Who knows what they were intended for. I don't think she ever used them primarily because they are still nice and neat on the card. But now they're mine and maybe someday I will need them. And then there were some other treasures. This is also by Boy. These are size 3, so these are the same size as the other Boy needles. Um, but these are double points size 3, and I guess this is more of a traditional, doesn't say how long, but I would guess a 5 inch needle. And it comes in this handy little tube. which I thought was pretty interesting to see them in a tube. This tube of four double-pointed size 3 boy aluminum needles cost her 50 cents, whereas the 7-inch cost her 85 cents. And she's got a lot of math. She's got a math problem worked out here. She was adding something, so maybe she did use those. I don't know. But my favorite are these. These were made by Hero. They're size one, and they are aluminum sock pins. That's what they're called, aluminum sock pins. And again, they're just double-pointed needles. Look pretty much like any metal double-pointed needle you'd get today. She, at some point, put cellophane tape around the edge, which, of course, is brittle with age. I'm not sure what that was for, if she did that or if that's the way they came, but pretty much falling off. So, Hero, made by the Hero Manufacturing Company of Middle Middleborough, Mass. These say 7-inch. They say 7-inch, but, so, 7 and 10. So I guess these are seven inch as well. Aluminum sock pins that are now all over my lawn. I'll pick those up in a second. So anyway, I just thought you might be interested in some vintage um, knitting needles. Quite a far, um, quite different from um, the needles most people are using today, but I have used um, I have used aluminum double pointed needles when I first started learning how to knit socks, and they work. This is always my difficulty. Do I buy the new thing that I hear everybody talking about, or do I just dig in my stash and find something that works? Because again, who's gonna who's gonna take all these knitting needles? Now, all three of my sons attended a Waldorf school when they were small. All three of them have knit a pair of socks when they were in fifth grade. None of them are currently knitting, but they, you know, they could. Who knows? So maybe, some, maybe one of them, or maybe one of their wives or girlfriends someday will want all my knitting stuff, or a grandchild. You never know. But I don't want to accumulate a ton more than I already have. So I have to be, be thoughtful um, about my knitting needle purchases. So I think that's going to be it for today. I hope to do this one more time before school starts. Um, mid to late August will become crazy busy. And then who knows what I'll have time for. But um, if you watched the first one and came back, thank you very much. And um, I hope you have a great rest of your summer. Um, until I see you again. Bye-bye.